You know, one of the most common complaints that I hear today is this, I'm overloaded. <laughs> I just can't get it all done. I, I can't catch up. I need a break. I'm, I'm overloaded. Now on your message notes there at the top, I've listed some commonly sourced areas of over, overload. In other words, we are often overloaded from too many activities. If you're a parent with kids in school right now, you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're, you're chauffeuring back and forth activities. There are too many choices in the world. There are too many changes in the world. We get overloaded from too much work, too much debt, too many worries. Uh, we, we get overloaded from too much information uh, from the internet and from the media, uh, too much accessibility in your life. The pace of life, uh, the speed of life uh, has gotten faster and faster. So how overloaded are people today? Well, let me just give you some statistics. People today sleep two and a half fewer hours on average each night than they did 100 years ago. So we're getting less sleep. Uh, the average work week in America is actually longer than it was in the 1960s. We're working longer hours, we're getting less sleep. The average office worker, they did a study and said that 36 hours of work is piled up on the average office worker's desk. And they spend about three hours a week just sorting through it to find different things. You know, I think in my own life, I have many different email accounts that I checked one this morning, which is a, uh, got a lot of junk mail account and over 21,000 unread emails in that particular account. So we're chronically rushed. We're chronically late. We're chronically exhausted. Have you ever felt like Job? Look at that verse on your outline. Job 3.26 says this. I have no peace. I have no quiet. I have no rest and trouble keeps coming. That sounds like overload. So today, I'm gonna to launch this new series that I'm calling Living with a Margin, Living with a Margin. And my goal is to lower your stress and to increase uh, your peace of mind. Now I need to give you some definitions right at the start of the series. What do I mean by margin? Well, a margin uh, is the space, write this down. Margin is the space between my load and my limits, my load and my limits. In other words, what, my, what I've got to do, my responsibilities, and how much energy and effort and whatever else I need to get it done. My load and my limits, the space between. But having margin is, is having some breathing room in your life, uh, that you have some reserves in your life. Now you need margin in every area of your life. Uh, you need physical margin, uh, and so you're, you're not always going so you don't wear out. You need spiritual margin for handling temptation and, and uh, ministry, because uh, those are draining. We need emotional margin in our lives for the relationships in our lives. We need financial margin to uh, avoid the pressure of debt. When you don't have any margin in your finances, guess what? You're in deep debt. We need time margin uh, in your schedule. And we're gonna look at each of these in this series. So please, please don't miss any one of the, the messages. Uh, you know, I have a friend named George and he told me this. He said, you know, Rick, there are only three ways that you can arrive any place. You can arrive early, uh, you can arrive on time, or you can arrive late. Now, for most of my life, he said, George said, my goal was simply to arrive right on time. Time. But he said, when my goal was to arrive right on time, he said, I consistently arrived five minutes late. It's because I allowed no margin because things go wrong. You forget your keys, there's traffic, there's all kinds of stuff. And he said, you know, as a result, Rick, I always felt stressed. I always felt pressured as I rushed in the last 15 minutes to get ready and get to my next meeting. He said, rather than feeling peace, I often felt panic. Now he said, since I have multiple meetings every day, George said, I, I began to think about the cumulative negative effect of putting my mind and my body through 15 minutes of tension several times a day because I was stressing out. And he said it was an unnecessary strain on my soul. And he said, I figured out that about 15 minutes of hurrying in meet, to different meetings that I go to every day, three times a day for 15 years, added up to nearly six solid months of unnecessary tension. 
Can you imagine that? That's solid 24 hour days. That's 171 24 hour days of stress or 4,106 hours of tension. He said, just because I wasn't building in margin. And he said, that was, you know, only if nothing went wrong and there was no traffic and then it might take longer and I was gonna have to deal with that. So George told me, he said, you know, Rick, I started adding margin to my schedule and leaving earlier. When I had to pick up the kids, when I had to go to a meeting, uh, uh, leaving early for getting to church and finding a parking spot. You know what that one's like. He says, as a result, I'm much more relaxed. I'm much more at peace. I'm, I'm enjoying life more. And I suggest you try it. Now in this series, we're gonna look at many of the benefits of living with a margin. But as this introduction is going on, let me just mention a couple things. Uh, and in future messages, you're gonna learn about the biblical basis of each of these. Uh, a first benefit, you'll have a healthier mind if you build margin into your life. You won't be hurried and worried all the time. You'll have more peace of mind. You'll be thinking, uh, uh, your thinking will improve. You'll have more time to think. Second, you'll have a healthier body. You know, unrelenting stress actually harms your body. Your body needs downtime to repair itself. That's one of the purposes of the Sabbath, which God commands. You know, in high performance race cars, you, you know, you ha they have to schedule pit stops for crew repairs. And if you're gonna live a high performance life, you're gonna have to schedule pit stops for margin, for repairs. You can't fix anything going 200 miles an hour. And that's not just true in race cars, it's true in life. A, a third benefit of if you'll build margin into your life that we're gonna teach you in the weeks uh, ahead, you're gonna have healthier relationships because relationships take time. And margin, if you build margin in your life, it'll give you more time to enjoy each other, to just sit around and talk, to listen, to, you know, to comfort each other when you need to have fun together. When you have no margin in your life, you start skimming relationally. And your family doesn't get the best of you, and the people you love don't get the best of you. Families without margin have more conflict. It's a symptom. Let me give you one more. Uh, the fourth benefit would be you're more available to God to use. God can use you when you have margin in your life. When you are overloaded, the only thing you can think of is survival. You don't have anything to give. You're too busy to care. You're too busy to serve. You're too busy to hear God. Some of you, if God wanted to call you with some good news, you'd get a busy signal. So this is why we're gonna spend some time getting ready uh, to uh, live lives of margin. Less stress, more peace of mind. So you ready? You ready for a, a change to a more sane and stable and less stressful lifestyle? Are you ready to make space to slow the pace of your life? Well, that's what we're gonna start with this, this weekend. And today, what I wanna do is just look at some very first steps in living with a margin. Some of these we'll come back to and look at in, in more detail, but I wanna just give you an, an overview. Here's the first step, very first step. If you're gonna live a life of margin, first I must accept my human limitations. I, I must accept my human limitations. I gotta remind myself that I'm not God, I'm not even Superman. You know, we, the, the truth is we secretly think that the rules don't apply to us, that we're invincible, that we can keep going and going and going and going and going without rest and recharging, but the truth is we're only human. You are not indestructible. The Bible says, look at this verse in your outline, Psalm 119, 96, I have learned that everything has limits. Have you learned that? That, that, that your, your time is limited? Your money is limited? Your wisdom is limited? Your energy is limited? Everything in your life is limited. Now, you know why we, we don't believe that? It's because we live in a culture that says the exact opposite. We live in a culture that says there are no limits. And you know what? That's a lie. It's a lie. But we, we buy into this lie in movies and books. You know, there's never been a bestseller titled, Your Limited Life. <laughs> 
No, no. Instead, all the bestsellers lie and they say things like, you can be anything. There are no limits. Live a limitless life. Well, you, you can't be anything. That's just not true. You're never going to sing in the Metropolitan Opera, no matter how much you desire it and pray for it and set a goal for it. Can you fly like a bird? No, you're never going to fly like a bird. You can't do anything. It's a lie. You can only do what God has created you to do. Can you go six months without eating anything? <laughs> no, well, some of us could, but uh, most of you couldn't do that. Now, those limitations, those human limitations, who do you think they came from? They came from God. God is the author of our limits. He intentionally gave you limits for your own good and your own protection, and he knows best. And if you ignore those limitations, you're the one who gets hurt. Now, unfortunately, we're, we're not very adept at, at knowing our limits. We always overestimate our abilities. So let me just quickly mention uh, four limitations you need to accept when I say accept your limitations. First, you need to accept that you have physical limitations. You can't swim to Hawaii. Uh, you can't glow without sleep for a week. You have a limited amount of energy. And that's why, by the way, energy management is more important than time management. We all have the same amount of time, but we all don't have the same amount of energy. Second, you have emotional limits. You're, now, these are harder to identify, but the emotional limits in your life uh, uh, can really affect your, uh, your um, uh, relationships. Third, you've got, you've got uh, uh, in, in, your, in your emotional limits, physically, by the way, um, you might not be able to carry 10 people. You might be able to carry one person. You know, if I said, can you carry this person into the hospital? You might carry one, but you couldn't carry 10. You wouldn't even try to carry 10 people physically. But how many people are you trying to carry emotionally right now? Think about that one. How many people do you think you can carry emotionally? Three, five, seven, 10? I mean, where do you draw the line? You have emotional limits. Then you have mental limits. There's a limit to how much information you can handle, how much you can process. And we're on overload because the media is overloading us. The internet's overloading us. Your, your cell phone's overloading you. And your mind, mind starts shutting down. You know, scientists are studying this right now, uh, the, the damage to our minds and to our attention spans. What you need is a filter. And we'll talk about this in this series. Then you have time limitations. Job 14, five says this, our time is limited. You, God, have given us only so many months to live and you've set the limits that we cannot go beyond. Your day will never have more than 24 hours. So you have time limits. You know, when, when the battery on your phone starts to die, it warns you. It says you got 5% left and you have to go plug it in. And you know if you don't plug it in, it's, it's gonna die. Now, you may think that you personally don't have any warning lights that start blinking at 5%, but you do. In fact, you have many warning lights that God's put in your life to tell you when you're at 5%. Pain is a warning light. Stress is a warning light. Fatigue is a warning light. Irritability is a big warning light that you're way beyond your margin. Apathy, you stop caring. Loss of enthusiasm, loss of joy. These are warning lights that you have hit your limit. So step one is just to recognize that as a human being, I have human limitations. Step number two, if you're gonna live a life of margin, I have to ask myself, what drives me to overload my life? Write that down. Ask myself what drives me to overload my life. And you're going to need to do some honest evaluation of your motivations. Why? Now, the Bible has a lot to say about motivation. And the Bible tells us that people overwork for many different reasons. Some people overwork out of insecurity. Some people work out of fear. Some people, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, overwork out of envy of others and what they have. Some people overwork out of a desire to impress. We're gonna come back to this point in another message. So let me just give you one verse. Ecclesiastes 4.8 says this. Some people are never satisfied with what they own and they never stop working to get more. They should ask themselves, why am I always working to have more? What a senseless and miserable life. 
Now, if I'm gonna learn to live on a margin, I have to learn uh, to ask the tough questions. Here's a third step. If I'm gonna learn to live on a margin, I must expect problems and delays. I'm talking about just in life in general. I must expect problems and delays. We know that there are gonna be problems and delays, but we don't act like it. I mean, you know that nothing goes as planned, but you still act like it will. You know there's gonna be traffic, but you still leave late. You know, airlines actually build in margin into their flights. A one hour flight of an airline is always listed as like an hour and a half flight to account for delays and problems at the terminal. Now, Jesus warned us in John 16, in the world, you will have trouble. So why are we surprised when this happens? We should expect problems and delays. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a little true confession here. I'm naturally an optimistic person. You know that. And so my attitude toward life is it'll all work out. But sometimes uh, optimism without planning, that's just a setup for disaster. I remember years ago, I convinced Kay uh, in a moment of her weakness to take a vacation with absolutely no planning, uh, zero planning. I said, uh, it, it'll be fine. We'll just call it an adventure. We'll just get in the car with all the kids and we'll head out and it'll be fun. No planning. We, I called it our pinball vacation because here's what happened. Uh, the first night we ended up sleeping in the car our family of five, because there were no vacant motels, motels in, in, in Durango, Colorado. Second night, we ended up sleeping in the car again because there were no vacant motels in the entire city of Denver. I mean, how was I to know it was National Rodeo Week? <laughs> I, I didn't know. The third night, we ended up staying in the Notel Roche Motel in Dumpyville, Utah. <laughs> it was terrible. And there were cockroaches crawling across the walls and stuff. Uh, the last night of that vacation, we spent in a very loud, smoky lounge in Las Vegas, waiting for the only room that would be empty at 1 a.m. It was an adventure, just not a good adventure. You, you got to expect problems and delays. Now, part of living on a margin involves thinking ahead. And the Bible says it's a mark of wisdom. Look at this verse, Proverbs 22, three. Sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it. But an unthinking person will walk right into it and later regret it. You gotta plan ahead. That's part of lowering the stress. Now, let me give you a fourth step. Uh, another step to living with margin is to add buffer space in my schedule add buffer space in my schedule. It's unplanned time. You don't fill up everything in your schedule. You build in some buffer zones. You build in some downtime. And we'll teach you how to do this. And don't expect somebody else to do this for you. If you don't do this for yourself, it's not gonna happen. You know when I've taught you about living on a financial margin, that living on a budget, that I, I say always pay God first, that's your tithe, and you pay yourself second, that's your savings, and then you use the rest of your money the best you can to do the other things, but you pay God first, you pay yourself second. The same should be true with your time. You give God the first of your time, and you give the, you the second part of your time to re-energize and, and to uh, refresh and spend time first with God and then time whatever re-energizes you. And then you use the time for all your commitments and other things. You need to leave some empty pages in your day timer. You don't cram every hour with activities. By the way, you know who the worst offenders uh, of this are? Often doctors and contractors. You know, they, they overbook patients or they overbook clients. They don't leave any room for uh, or margin for error. And then you end up waiting in the waiting room, wasting, wasting time. Psalm 127 verse two says this, it is senseless. Look at this verse. It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing you'll starve to death. That's a fear uh, cause of uh, workaholism. For God wants his loved ones to circle this, get their proper rest. Now, I want you to write this down, okay? Write it down in your outline. The faster you go, the more margin you need. Write that down. The faster I go, the more margin I need. Now, the Bible tells us 
that not allowing space in your schedule is foolish. Look at this verse, Ecclesiastes 10, 15. Only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. I love that, today's English version. What the Bible's saying is that life is a journey. It is not a 50-yard dash, and it doesn't matter who's running the fastest. It is not about speed. It's not about how fast you live. It's about how well you live. That's what it means to live on a margin. Number five, here's a fifth first step in making some major changes in your life. You're gonna have to learn to do this. Prune my activities regularly. I need to prune my activities regularly. You know, I, I grow vegetables. Uh, one year I grew 57 different kinds of vegetables. I grew fruit, 17 kinds of fruit trees, but I also grow roses. And every January 28th, which is my birthday, I prune my roses. I mean, I just whack them all back down to almost nothing every January 28th or a day or two around that. Now, every year, like there were this year, there are always rose bushes with buds that still haven't even bloomed yet, and they're waiting there. And as I'm getting ready to whack them off, and I'm ruthless, I can imagine that little rose bud saying, but Rick, I haven't even bloomed yet, and I will give you so much pleasure. If you just wait another week or two, I will bloom, and I will give this to you but I'm ruthless and I just whack it all and it's painful and I cut off not simply dead wood, I cut off things that haven't even bloomed yet. Now, why am I doing this? And I'm sure those roses are going, why are you doing this to us? The answer is the, the bush will be healthier, they will have more blooms and I know from experience that uh, less than 60 days later, I'm gonna have roses again in full bloom on those rose bushes. Now, Let's apply this to your life. Every year of our lives, we're sprouting new activities, but you can't keep adding new stuff without taking off old stuff. If you get so many irons in the fire, you put out the fire. You burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. So you periodically must prune for greater fruitfulness. Jesus talked about it in the book of John about pruning. And as I said, you don't, when you look to give some margin in your life, to build some space, to build some white space, some buffer zones. You don't just prune dead wood because you don't have enough dead wood. You have to cut back some living branches. Look at what God says in his word, Ecclesiastes 3.6. Here are several verses. Ecclesiastes 3.6 says, there's a time to keep things and there's a time to throw things away. What do you need to throw away? What activity? Do you need to stop? You need to throw away. You need to prune. You need to cut back. Hebrews 12, verse one, the, the second half of the verse says this, we should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. So he's not just talking about sins. He's talking about stuff that's not sin, but it gets in the way. You, need, I, 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 you could probably cut out a third of what you're doing and be healthier. Not everything you're supposed to do is, is, everything God wants you to do is everything you're doing. You're doing far more. If you don't have time to get it all done, it just means something is either not God's will or you're doing it in the wrong way. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 says this. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. In Christ, you have freedom, but it's permissible but it's not all beneficial. What that verse is saying is real simple. Some things are not necessarily wrong, but they're just not necessary. And the good can keep you from the best. You need to learn how to say no. And if you got 50 things to do, uh, and you've only got time to do 20, then you've got to say no 30 times. Now, it's easy to say no to activities you hate. No, I'm not gonna get the root canal. I'm not gonna get the colonoscopy. I'm not gonna do the IRS audit. <laughs> but it's more difficult to say no to the things you enjoy. Look at this verse where Joshua told the people in Joshua 7, 13, second part of the verse, some of you are keeping things God commanded you to destroy 
and you'll never defeat your enemies until you throw away those things. What are the idols in your life? What are the idols in your schedule? What are the idols in your budget? Now, I just have to buy this. I just have to spend time on this. I just have to watch this TV show. Maybe you just need to throw it away. Now, let me give you the most important step of all. Number six, walk with Jesus and learn. If you want to lower the stress, you need to get very acquainted with Jesus and learn. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 is one of the most powerful passages on stress relief in the Bible. It's so important, we'll come back and do a whole message just on this verse. But I wanna read it to you in the message paraphrase. Just listen to this. Jesus is talking to you. These are his words. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Walk with him and learn. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. You know, we don't have any example of Jesus running in scripture. He always was at the right time at the right place. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? That's what we want to do in this series. Learn the unforced forced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, Jesus says, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. This is going to be a very important series for you and for our church because most people are living without margin in their lives in Southern California and also in our other campuses in Hong Kong and in Buenos Aires and in Berlin and in Manila because these are busy urban areas. This could radically change your life. I hope you'll be here every week. It may add years to your life. It may save your life. Certainly gonna make your life more enjoyable if you learn how to live on a margin. Some of you really need this series and you know who you are. You know, I wanna close with uh, a couple of emails um, uh, from people that I, I have shared some of these principles with. I, I, when I'm counseling or giving advice to people and I meet people who are on the edge of burnout, uh, let, me, let me read you a couple of these. Uh, Hi, Pastor Rick, just wanna let you know that your advice did the trick for me uh, this Sunday after church. On the way home from the 8 a.m. service, I took the long way through rural Orange County instead of rushing home on the toll road. I stopped at a diner for breakfast. I took a little while to get served, but I, I didn't fret it. Then I took a one hour nap, despite our house being messy. Then I took a leisurely Laguna Canyon drive to a family gathering. Then again, I took the long way home driving up the coast and stopping at an inspirational point overlooking the ocean just to look and talk to the Lord. <laughs> then I took another nap. I like this guy. Uh, he says, I took another nap, half hour this time. I can't recall the last time I had two naps in one day. Then I chatted with both roommates in the kitchen about the Lord. And then with the house still messy, I sat in the jacuzzi <laughs> before going to bed. I know all this may sound very simplistic, but I was so inspired uh, by your advice on learning to slow down and how to take a Sabbath, a real Sabbath, that I thought I'd try a true day of rest. Now today, Monday, I woke up energized and ready to change the world. Man, this works. It really works. Thanks. That's change. Let me give you another one. Pastor Rick, I want to thank you for your advice. Uh, some of the things you shared were like holding a mirror up to my face. I have been filling my life with activities and even ministries to keep myself so busy that I wouldn't have to, have to think about or face some of the real issues that, that I need to deal with. So thank you for your advice. I rested yesterday and the world did not come to an end. I read the entire Sunday paper for the first time in ages. I talked to friends without having to rush off somewhere to do an errand. I enjoyed watching my kids play with their friends. I sat in the room I had redecorated so that I could relax, but I never had, and I just enjoyed it. Most importantly, I talked to God a lot during my quiet moments, and I painfully admitted to him that I have been missing my times 
with him. Now, the best thing of all that happened to me is it felt great to get back on track with God. Margin makes a difference. And all day long, I found myself asking, what would happen if I just sat still for two minutes? What was I so scared of? It was great. I know, Rick, that there's some painful things that are gonna surface as I clear my schedule and my mind has time to contemplate. But if I'm close to God, there isn't anything that I can't face because I'm not facing it alone. Thanks so much for teaching me about margin. It's an answer to prayer to my life. You know, one of the benefits actually of living an overloaded life, there's just one benefit to it. It eventually, eventually forces us to, to trust God more because you're gonna come to the end of your rope. You're gonna recognize your limitations one way or the other. You can either look up to God or God can put you flat on your back and then you look up to him. Now, I have a recommendation uh, for your small group. All of our 8,000 plus small groups during the upcoming weeks of this series on uh, learning to live on a margin. I wanna encourage you to use the talk it over questions. You know, those are the questions that are prepared every weekend that go with the weekend message. And you can get those talk it over questions to go deeper with these messages. And when you honestly talk in your small group, about where you need margin. And of these five or six steps I just shared with you just now this week, you can help each other apply these principles. I'm gonna be praying for you. Would you be praying for me in the weeks uh, ahead while I'm doing these doctor's tests and they're working on uh, you know, my meds? Uh, it's okay with me. And I'm gonna take time in margin in my own life. I'll use this to be uh, letting God talk to me in ways that he wants to talk to me. Let's bow our heads for prayer. You know, Father, we have, um, we've lived without margin in our lives for so long, we can hardly remember what it was like to not feel fatigue, to not feel pressured all the time. But we don't want to stay that way anymore. And I'm praying, Father, for our flock I pray for everybody here today, everybody who's listening, and even those listening online, and those who are listening on Daily Hope. I pray that you will give every person hearing my words the courage to take these six initial steps that can bring balance and sanity back into our lives and our, our schedules and our relationships. Now with their heads still bowed, why don't you pray? I'll just pray a prayer and, and, and you can say, me too, God. If this expresses your heart, say, Father, I'm tired of being rushed. Just you say that to God. Father, I'm tired of being rushed. I'm tired of being late. I'm tired of being exhausted all the time. I got too many irons in the fire and I need your help to get out of the mess that I've gotten myself into. Help me to recognize and accept my limitations. Help me to ask the tough questions of why I'm so driven to overwork and to fill my life and overbook it. Help me to put some space in my schedule. Father, I need breathing room. I need margin in my life. And Jesus Christ, I know that I can't do it all but I need your wisdom in deciding what matters most. I do not want to waste my life. Just tell that to God right now. God, I, I do not want to waste my life. Please give me the courage to say no to the wrong things and the courage to say yes to the right things. And Father, most important, help me to trust you more, to walk with Jesus and learn from him. Forgive me for thinking and acting as if everything depends on me. It doesn't. It depends on you. And I want to ask you to use this series in my life. And I want you to give me greater faith in you and less reliance upon myself. I want my life to bring pleasure to you. And I humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online only small group that meets on platforms like Skype or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day to day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.